Marangaria, Nadu, Injimara, Eora Mine, Nadu, Injimara, Gadigal, Nurumbang. I want to pay my respects to the people of the Eora Nation and the land of the Gadigal people. Tonight, you shouldn't talk about politics and religion, but we have both. Is faith finished? Have we lost our belief in God and politics? What do we turn to? And should faith groups back an Indigenous voice on the panel? British journalist and broadcaster Andrew Neil. Head of Indigenous Studies at the University of Divinity, Anne Patel Gray. Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Raphael. Labor Senator for WA, Fatima Payman. And President of the New South Wales and Federal Young Liberals, Dimitri Chug Palmer. And we ask is there no end to the Trump circus? Welcome, I'm Stan Grant, and do remember you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag, so please get involved. Coming up later, we're going to discuss the media and echo chambers on both sides of politics. Let's get started tonight, though. Here's a question from Helen Zing. As Australia becomes more diverse, both religiously and ethnically, do you think the Easter story is still relevant today? Kanishka. Uh, yes, well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, of course, absolutely, I think it's relevant. Uh, I think um, the Easter message is relevant uh, if you're interested in hope, because it is a great proclamation of hope. God has planted the cross of Jesus Christ in history as a declaration of his undying love. Uh, Jesus has laid down his life uh, for the forgiveness of sin that we might be adopted into God's family and filled with his spirit and God has raised him from the dead as judge and Lord of all, opening up for us new life, empowered by God's spirit uh, and living for his kingdom. That's the Christian story. And uh, we think it's the best news going around. And Patel Gray, why are so many people turning away from that message then? I think it would have been nice considering Easter is a, is a time of atonement and yet the church has had an opportunity to uh, atone for the history of colonisation, the theft of our land, and yet not one church mentioned that history, nor did they atone for that history. Hope is found in the atonement. And, you know, where's the hope of a nation if you can't atone for the sins of your past? I'll put that straight back to Kanishka. Um, what's the response to that? Because if we are talking about a time of atonement, why isn't there this question addressed during this time? Uh, well, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a valid point. Um, uh, I think uh, it is part of um, an ongoing process. I think uh, if I speak for the Sydney Anglican Church, um, I think we have uh, uh, set out uh, over at least the last 20 years, which is late in the piece, mm. um, but we've set out in a journey to try and uh, listen to Aboriginal brothers and sisters in Christ, to walk in humility and friendship, uh, acknowledging many failures, uh, encouraging uh, Indigenous Christian leadership, trying to listen to the stories and um, uh, trying to engage with that in an open and humble way. I'm not sure that answers the question that Anne raised, but we are going to get time to explore that. Um, uh, Andrew Neil, when we talk about faith, we're also talking about identity, national identity, personal mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. I know in the UK and Europe, there are real questions about whether Europe, for instance, is still Christian and what role that plays. Why in the West are we seeing a turn away from faith? In other parts of the world, faith seems to be booming. Mm. Well, of course, he has to say that he's just irrelevant, otherwise he's out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, what's the point of an archbishop if Easter doesn't matter, uh, really? I think uh, Easter, I think for most people, Easter's a holiday. Yeah. Uh, it's a long weekend. For some countries, it's a three-day weekend, and others, it's a four-day weekend. Whether that's good or bad is another matter. Whether society's better from having moved away from that... Uh, What's your view I, on I don't really know. 
I don't think it really makes that much difference. I mean, I think Europe is moving into a post-Christian phase now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent a lot of time in France. That's historically an incredible Christian country. Mm -hmm. Only 5% of French people go to church now. Mm -hmm. uh, in Britain, uh, there's a running joke in Britain that uh, no, I'm no longer religious, I'm an Anglican. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> you know, I just don't think it, it, it really matters to people uh, that much, and I think they have other concerns. They have other religions in a way mm. as well. You mentioned yeah. identity. That's mm. become, for a lot of people, the most important part of their, their makeup. Interesting that the more east you go in Europe, yeah. the more religious it becomes. Mm. Indeed, Catholicism in Britain was given a boost when over a million Poles arrived. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly the Catholic Church was seeing a lot of people. I think just part of the problem is, you know, Easter has happened. On Easter Friday, it was reported in the American newspapers that an investigation in Baltimore of the behavior of Catholic priests had revealed yet again hundreds of kids being appallingly abused yeah. by priests. Uh, 600 at one stage, not just being abused, being tortured. Not a single member of that Catholic church was ever held to account. Nobody was tried. Mm. No, indeed, the Catholic church's main response was to try to cover it up. So I think you can understand that people have lost a bit of faith in religion yeah. when you see that kind of behaviour. Uh, Fatima, uh, Andrew makes the point that it's often geographic and often when you look at other faiths, there is growth. And there's a lot of growth in Islam. Mm. What's the difference there? Can you talk about what is the attraction for people and people who are also making the conversion or reversion, as you would say, um, to Islam? versus the decline of Christianity, particularly in the West? I wouldn't really focus on the decline of Christianity, and I will only speak on behalf of the Muslim faith, Islam. Uh, and I think it, people are starting to notice that, for me in particular, um, faith provides that sense of morality, that sense of guidance. It holds me accountable uh, for my actions. It's a source of... Uh, you know, humility, and it keeps me grounded. So I, I can only speak for myself, and I think uh, the idea of justice, equality, um, and freedom of expression is what makes Australia sort of such a beautiful nation in terms of us being able to express the, uh, the various faiths mm. and backgrounds we come from. Well, there's a lot more to explore in this area, and we're going to get to that. But just quickly, Dimitri, for you, what does Easter mean? Because you are a, a practising Christian as well, I understand. Yeah, so I'm a practising Christian <clears throat> and Easter for me is all about hope, forgiveness and love. And I think even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not a believer, um, that's something that we can all look to and something that I think we all need at this point um, in our life and, and, and in this point in history. Um, it really is something that guides me um, and gives me a lot of comfort and I hope that it gives a lot of other people comfort. I think that the decline of religion um, is not necessarily a good thing for our society. I think that lots of people out there, particularly young people, are really hurting um, and we're seeing them struggle with their mental health because they don't have a, a worldview that allows them to have hope um, for the future. And I think that's what faith really can provide you with, a sense of hope, uh, a sense of connection to community. I mean, people aren't joining service organisations like Rotary or Lions. They're not getting involved in community organisations as much as they used to once upon a time. And I think that's not a good thing for society. I think we've seen more fragmentation and less of a sense of mm. connection. So churches and religion can play a really important role in providing a sense of support network, um, particularly to young people. Um, so I'd really encourage everybody to take um, the last three days of Easter as an opportunity to, to revisit um, faith, whether that's the Christian faith. I mean, we've just had Easter, so uh, that seems we've like a pretty obvious We've also had Passover and Ramadan. And we've had mm. Passover and we're in the month of Ramadan as well. So I'd really encourage everybody to take this time to, to give it another chance and give it another look. Um, yeah. It leads us to the topic of our online poll tonight. We're asking you, with a majority of Australians no longer identifying as Christians, should politicians still say the Lord's Prayer at the start of hmm. each sitting day. You can cast your votes on our Facebook and Twitter accounts and we're going to bring you those results a little bit later. Let's go now to Larissa Minicon. My question is for Archbishop Kanishka. Um, I am a member of the Sydney Diocese and the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman to sit as a member of Synod. Um, since the launch of the No campaign from the Liberal Party and their constant manipulation of their democratic powers in regards to the voiced parliament, will the church respond to the Liberal Party's no campaign? And will they support the voiced parliament? 
Thank you, Larissa. And uh, I want to acknowledge Larissa, as she has said, the first uh, Indigenous woman to be elected to the Sydney Synod. Uh, and with her, uh, Uncle Ray and Auntie Sharon, who have been uh, such fantastic contributors to the life of the Sydney Anglican Church uh, in so many ways. And so I just want to uh, honour and acknowledge you all uh, in that way. Um, uh, well, as you know, uh, um, Larissa, in fact, uh, moved a resolution at our Synod last year in September, uh, which uh, was adopted by the Synod, um, welcoming the conversation about the voice, uh, recognising that it was an important step in reconciliation, uh, that uh, it was for the well-being of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, mm. uh, and um, uh, committing to learn about the voice and encouraging uh, Sydney Anglicans uh, to give generous consideration to voting yes. And so, um, uh, as part of that process of education and taking the lead of the Synod uh, to engage in a generous way um, with this question, which is a serious matter about our constitution, um, uh, I've contributed uh, an essay to a recently published book of essays by faith leaders from a very broad range of um, uh, religions. Um, and again, speaking from the position of the Sydney Anglican Church, we're very conscious that uh, as an institution, we were amongst the first to benefit from the dispossession of Aboriginal people. Um, Arthur Phillip landed in 1788 and by 1792, the first grant was made to the church in Sydney. And so we continue to benefit uh, from that dispossession, which continues to cause uh, trauma to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, the uh, statement of the heart, uh, from the heart, was a generous invitation uh, to walk together. And so as Sydney Anglicans, we're committed to doing that. Um, our own Theology Commission has produced a paper on this. Um, and the concept of reconciliation, of course, is central to the ministry of Jesus. And it's clear in scripture that reconciliation with God produces an imperative for reconciliation between mm. people. I, I, I want to just I'll, I'll bring, I'll bring you in on this, Anne, and I want to come back to Larissa, um, whether she's happy with the answer that you got from the Archbishop, but Anne. Mm. Look, you know, if we reflect on a theological point of view and if we look at the biblical narratives in, in 2 Corinthians 5, you know, mm. the church is called mm. to be called by God to be Christ's ambassadors for justice and reconciliation. And, and I don't know why we keep jumping over the word justice, you know, because I can't be reconciled unless there is justice. I heard a, a, a one of our uh, church leaders say, we are one in Christ. How I wish that were true. Because while I'm oppressed... And while my nation remains oppressed, we can never be one in Christ because being one in Christ means me having the same rights, the same privilege, the same wealth as every other Australian enjoys. And the statement from the heart, you know, sadly it's been politicised. It was a statement coming from our, the heart of our nation to... Australia saying, we want to be recognised. We want to be heard. You know, and, and now we've turned it into something that's more than that. And if we look at our history, two and a half centuries of our history, of where we've been marginalised and silenced, and I heard a politician say that this policy is going to be a racial division. My goodness, you need to know your history because we've already had racial division since 1788. Can I, can I come back to you, Larissa? Do I take it from, from the tone of your question that you don't feel as if you're being supported by the church or the archbishop right now? Um, that's correct. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we committed at St John's in Glebe and as part of Scar Tree Indigenous Ministries is to promote this Yes campaign as, as the motion was put forward. But it has landed on us as uh, the three of us, you know, in our little church 
to to be you know out there talking to our Sydney diocese mm. and to be promoting it, doing it for free. And to be honest, I'm exhausted. Yeah. So what do I'm you say to the, what do you the say conversation? To the help. <laughs> help. <laughs> yeah, work with them. We want to help, Larissa. Yeah. We really do. Yeah. We but, really but, do. But, but, if it, but why aren't you doing more? Because Larissa is clearly saying you need more. Yeah, I mean, now that the No campaign has come out and it, it is so... Um, it's even harder to to decipher what they are saying. And really, we need the church to be, you know, the cross, you know, to be, this, to this be the, you know, the voice for our, us. Because we're just exhausted from this whole conversation. I say again yeah. to the churches, mm. if we are called by God to be Christ's ambassadors, for reconciliation and justice, then where is the church? The church have been given the mandate to drive this agenda and I don't understand why they are waiting for the government to do their job. Let, let, let me you have been given the job. Drive the agenda. Can I just add, Larissa, thank you for um, your question. And look, we hear you. And I know as important it is for churches to be involved, let me assure you that there are other uh, religious faiths, ethno-religious groups yes. that have pledged their support. Um, these are representing, you know, the Anglican, Catholic, Sikh, Hindu, Muslim um, and Jewish communities out there and we're there in solidarity with you. We're standing and we're voting yes. And yes, it's a, it's, it's a shame that Peter Dutton uh, and the Coalition have not taken this opportunity to unite the nation, to walk hand in hand towards that path for reconciliation. Um, but you're not alone. There are so many grassroots organisations and uh, business groups, there are community groups who are wanting to support this, well, we, who have pledged We're, we're going support. to come to the politics in just a moment, but I, I do, don't want to finish this without getting an answer from the Archbishop, because we haven't had one yet. Why are you not doing enough? Uh, look, um, uh, if we're not doing enough, we'll do more. Uh, we're not... Uh, uh, um, uh, it, it, we've encouraged a conversation, we've initiated that. I, I'm hearing Larissa say she's exhausted and she needs resourcing and um, we want to do that. I, I do think that in, in many parishes and many organisations these conversations are happening. Uh, I think there is uh, a, a, a great generosity of spirit towards it. I think it, it is true that constitutional reform is a very big topic. It's a lot for people to get their heads around. Um, and uh, uh, Sydney Anglicans are not in the habit of being told what to do by their Archbishop. Uh, but they are, be, they, they are open uh, to information, to education, uh, I think overwhelmingly uh, desire okay. to walk along with Indigenous people. Thank you, Larissa. Um, we'll go now to Sophie Wade. Sophie? Um, in the short term, what position will the young Liberals take in regards to Peter Dutton's ill-informed opposition to the Indigenous Voice to Parliament vote? And in the long term, what do you see as the young Liberals' role, if any, in dragging the Liberal Party into the 21st century on a range of issues, such as female representation in the party, climate change and minority representation, uh, to name it? <laughs> Thanks for your question, Sophie. And obviously, the, the topic of the Liberal Party's position on The Voice has, one that's, has been one that's attracted a lot of interest um, over the last week or so um, since the party came out and made its position clear. Um, as the Young Liberals, uh, we don't have a formal position on The Voice. It's not something that we've sat down and voted upon. Um, but what I can say is that there is a range of views that's reflective of the broad spectrum of Australia, from people that are really enthusiastic and supportive to people who just aren't sure to people who don't support it. Um, so there is that, that genuine broad range of views. I can say that my view is that I'm open to voting yes, but I think I, along with many other Australians, just want to get a few more answers and a, few, a bit more clarity on what exactly it is that we're voting on so that when we go to the ballot box, we know exactly what it is we're voting for. I think that there's still a long journey that we have to go on over the coming months um, before we get to the ballot box. And the government needs to engage in that process with sincerity. We've seen uh, polls... But, uh, but haven't we seen... Just, sorry, sorry sure, to mention, but haven't we already seen that 
Peter Dutton and the leadership of the Liberal Party have landed. They've had the questions they've wanted and they've said we're not supporting yeah, it. Not supporting so it. that decision's already been made. Yeah. Where does that leave you as a young Liberal? Well, as a young Liberal, I mean, I, I, I get to make up my own mind and that's the great thing about the Liberal Party is that we have freedom of individual conscience and we're not bound to a position um, that our parliamentary party takes. The young Liberals have an incredibly proud history of being the conscience of the Liberal Party. We're the ones that stand there and do the work on the ground and also speak up for what we think that young Australians think and believe and be a representative for that voice. Um, the Young Liberals play a really important role in the Liberal Party. I sit on our uh, state and federal executives in my capacity as the Young Liberal President um, and that means that young people have a voice at the table. So we're not bound to that position. But again, I, I, I would so reiterate... Do you, do you disagree with that position taking at the national level? Look, I, I think that the Liberal Party has an opportunity now to engage with uh, the ongoing committee process that we've got into the voice legislation. And I would really like to see them engage with that process constructively because at the end of the day, we're only going to get one question at the referendum. There's only going to be one question at the ballot box. Well, the Prime what Minister gave, you, um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the opposition leader almost eight chances and eight opportunities to engage in that That's consultation right. process. Um, the question came out very clear and it just seemed like Mr Dutton just used excuse after excuse mm. to just keep campaigning for no, that no vote. And it's almost very confusing. It's like, what, but Fatima, what clarification do you want? F yeah. Fatima, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't it incumbent on your side of politics to convince them? And you failed to do that. Does that now make it more difficult? to get a successful yes vote without bipartisanship? No, I don't think it will. I have faith in the Australian people. Mm. I have faith in grassroots level organisations. I have faith in our community groups, our faith groups, that we can do this without the coalition support. Like, mm. we have given you guys and, and, and your coalition party multiple opportunities to come to the table to discuss... Um, the question posed to the Australian people uh, and we're not afraid to continue campaigning for the yes vote and uh, we have complete faith in the Australian population. Andrew Neil, uh, you're watching this from the outside but you've had your own experience of the Brexit referendum. Mm -hmm. What do you draw on from that in your observations of what we're seeing here? Well, the if first anything... thing that struck me is that um, young politicians and old politicians have one thing in common, they don't answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've okay. answered the question. No, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, no, I think he's I think I, referring I to Dimitri. To you. I didn't point to you. Yeah. Uh, and it probably is something in the DNA uh, <laughs> uh, on that. Look, uh, I'm a visitor to this country. When, when I got on the plane from London a few days ago, The Voice was a television show. <laughs> but when I arrived in Sydney, it was a... It's it still a television a, show. <laughs> it was a constitutional Political amendment. <laughs> and it seems to me, just trying to catch up on this, that you are now going to have a really good debate. Yeah. And if you're going to change the Constitution on something so fundamental, as I understand it, there is widespread support for reconciliation. There's widespread support for making up the wrongs of the past as well. Uh, and, the, and widespread report, support that something should be done. How it should be done, you're now going to debate if this is the right way forward. And I think if you're going to change the Constitution, that's a good thing. What, you, should, you should have a debate. What do referendums reveal about a country? If you draw on the Brexit experience, um, it did reveal something fundamentally about Britain that many in the media or in inverted commas elite circles may have overlooked. Mm. Politicians really hate referenda. Yeah. Because they lose control over them. Yeah. And they don't know what the outcome will be. And the outcome can sometimes be disastrous for, for them. David Cameron was the British mm. Prime Minister. Mm. He lost the Brexit referendum. He's gone. Who's ever heard of David Cameron now? Uh, yet he'd just been elected for five years. They're unpredictable. Uh, who's leading each side can often have a big impact on the result. And it may have nothing to do with what you're talking about. So, just for example, if Mr Albanese, for other reasons, say the economy or defence policy or foreign policy, isn't that popular by, I think, October is when you're going to yeah. have the vote? Yeah. Isn't that popular by October? That will hit his side of the referendum, yeah. even though it's got nothing to do with the argument on the referendum itself. And then people often vote for reasons that have got nothing to do with the question being yeah. asked. A lot of people voted for Brexit in Britain, not because they were particularly interested in Britain leaving the European Union, but they wanted, basically, to thump the establishment.
Mm. And this was the best way of doing it because the whole of the British establishment was in favour of staying within the European Union. So people who felt marginalised, who felt left out, poorer cities in the north of England and so on, they felt, hey, this is the way we'll get them to take uh, notice of us. And, and, and I understand why you want as many people as possible to be on your side of the debate, but actually you can have too many. If it seems like a carve-up, uh, among the political elite on the left and the right, there will be a populist reaction to that. And it could actually be your downfall rather than your victory. I mean, I, I covered years ago, not long after dinosaurs ruled the earth, mm -hmm. uh, a referendum as to whether Norway should join the European Union yeah, or not. Yeah. Way back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. In that referendum, all the trade unions were in favor of joining. All of big business was in favor of joining. All the mainstream political parties were in favour of joining. Nearly all the media, pretty much all the media were in favour of joining. The Norwegian people said we're not going to join. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just them saying, we're not going to be tell told what to do. This is our one shot for us to make up our own minds. What do you, listening to that, Anne, and the voice of experience having lived through the bruising Brexit campaign and the others as well, what do you draw from that when you look ahead to what October may bring? Look, you know, what Australia needs to be conscious of, that this is not a political agenda. This is a moral and ethical agenda. And this will determine the integrity of Australia because individually every person has a role to play. Whether they vote yes or whether they uh, vote no is going to be to that individual's question of integrity. Now, the one thing that I'll bring to your attention is that the statement of the heart is a statement from the heart. Our people laid their soul bare to you and made themselves vulnerable in extending the hand to this nation and asking you to recognise us and to give us a voice. This country has criminalised our children. They are highly incarcerated. We're even locking up 10-year-olds. What a shame to this country. And yet, what you decide is going to determine our future. We shared with you our pain, but we also shared our hope. And if we don't have that hope recognised, you are then damning us to hell and you are going to kill a nation of people. Dimitri? Look, as, as Kanisha said um, in the previous segment, um, the Australia, the, our first Australians have given us an enormous invitation and I really want everybody to be able to support this voice. Um, that's something that I sincerely believe and I think lots of uh, people are approaching this with a good nature. I think it's so important that we do have a respectful debate on this topic and that we do work through the very important details that we need to see. We still haven't seen legislation for what exactly the voice is going to be. Now, raising those questions and raising those doubts is not about trying to find a way to frustrate or stop it. It's about being honest and so that we know what it is that we're voting for when we walk into the ballot box. I think that it's incumbent upon the government to be honest and upfront with the Australian people on that topic. That's not trying, again, that's not trying to frustrate the process. That's about trying to ensure its success. Um, Andrew makes a very good point. If it starts to look tricky, then people will start to be sceptical. And that's not a, a conducive way for us to actually move forward and reconcile with First Australians. I want to see us reconcile with First Australians. I think that it's the right thing to give them a say on decisions that affect them. That's a fundamentally liberal principle. That's why I think there are plenty of Liberals out there that will be supporting the referendum. But let's not characterise the debate by saying people who have questions, people who have doubts, they're just there to try and stop the process. That's not what's going on. I think everybody just wants to understand what it is that we're going to get after we vote in this referendum. If you're just joining us, uh, you're watching Q&A Live with Andrew Neil and Patel Gray, Kanishka Raphael, Fatima Payman and Dimitri Chugpama. I want to take you now back to a story from a couple of weeks ago and an update from a couple we spoke to then. Veteran Dave Whitfield and his wife Alison appeared on the show with a question for Veterans Affairs Minister Matt Keogh. Let's have a look. I'm actually offering you an invitation, Mr Keogh, to be a guest in our home 
and experience firsthand the the crisis resulting in your government's neglect of Australian veterans and their families. Mm. Well, we're happy to report that the Minister did indeed take up the couple's invitation last week and Alison and Dave told us it was a very positive experience. So a good outcome for a family doing it very tough right now. Mm. We're going to hear now from George Jovanovsky. Hi there. My question's for Andrew Neil. Donald Trump has been formally charged with falsifying his business records in a bid to hide damaging information during the 2016 presidential election. It makes Mr Trump the first former president in US history to face criminal charges. You've aptly noted that for most people, facing criminal charges is something of a career setback. But for Donald Trump, to quote you, it's an opportunity. Can you help us understand why that may be so? Help us understand Donald Trump. How long, you... <laughs> <laughs> How long have you got? Um, well, I've met Donald Trump, um, and it's much worse than you think. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so have a lot it, of other people who voted for him too. Well, and this, these charges against him are going to help him get more people yeah, to vote for also. him. That's the problem. I mean, Donald Trump is a lucky man given his enemies, because his enemies sometimes play into his hands. Mm. And he has been charged on this with falsifying business records. But that isn't, in American terms, a felony. That's a misdemeanor and it's already past the statute of limitations. If you're going to break the precedence of a no American president ever uh, being charged, you should have done it under something far tougher than this. Because the highly politicised courts, and America now has a highly politicised uh, um, politi uh, legal system, the district attorney who is taking on Mr Trump campaigned on the issue that he would get him. He, he, he said he'd already sued him a hundred times and campaigned to get that. So this is him trying to deliver. He has to prove something now very difficult, which is that this misdemeanor led to a felony, which was the corruption of the campaign laws. Mm. That is going to be really difficult to do, because as far as I can see, no, none of the campaign laws were broken, which is why I think Mr Trump is, is a, a lucky guy in this regard. The moment this took place, he managed to raise $15 million, yeah. 15 million wow, dollars nice. for his campaign. He is, you know, for Mr. Trump, publicity is like oxygen for the rest yeah. of us. Mm. You know, he can't exist without it. And he's in his element now. He's on the front of every newspaper, every broadcast. Here we are, 16,000 mm. miles from New York, and we're talking about it mm. as well. If he was seeing it tonight... Wall-to-wall -wall coverage when he turned great. up in New York. I think the mistake that was made was they went for the wrong charge. Mm. There are things that Mr Trump needs to answer for in the courts. His attempt to strong-arm the Georgia authorities just to find another 12,000 votes mm. that would have tipped Georgia over into his camp and therefore may have changed the result of the 2020 election, that seems to me far more important so, than putting a wrong entry into the business ledger. So will he, will he win in 2024? Ah, there's two things that are happening here. One is that uh, this will help him solidify the base, the Republican Party base. They're not rallying behind him again. Ron DeSantis, the governor mm. of Florida, who's the only one that really has a chance of beating Mr Trump in the Republican primaries, he's now looking like yesterday's man. He's looking a diminished fi uh, figure. The money's going towards uh, Mr Trump. And, and he'll be but, running against Joe Biden. Um... But, but then comes the general election. Mm. So even if Mr Trump still wins the Republican uh, a nomination. It is not clear that he wins the general election. Mr. Biden has beaten him before. Mr. Trump's candidates in the midterm elections uh, last year, in November 2022, all did very badly. The non Trump Republicans did uh, rather well. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. But what it means, I think, is very bad for the democratic world very bad for those of us who depend on the United States, as Australia now does on foreign policy and defence, and Britain is a close ally too. Because what it means at a time when war is still raging in Ukraine, and Taiwan is now under daily pressure 
from military exercises by the Chinese Navy and amphibious forces. It means that the most important democracy in the world is going to face a, a choice of a 78-year-old narcissist yeah. facing criminal charges and an 82-year-old guy who's not quite sure what room he's in at times. <laughs> Kaliska, I want to bring. You, 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 can, you can applaud. No, Paul, more. Yeah, yes, you Cole. can. <laughs> uh, Kaliska, um, what was the appeal to, to, to people of faith in Trump? Because particularly evangelicals mm. flock to him. Mm. What, what is he speaking to? Uh, well, um, as a blogger friend of mine said recently, uh, Mr. Trump is not the Messiah. Mm. Um, He's sure? a very naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <Ba -boom. laughs> We're waiting for that one. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> I was the you just that. give me the set <laughs> <laughs> out the park. <laughs> but 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 there was an appeal, and there remains an appeal. Why do people of faith see in Donald Trump potentially a political messiah? Mm. Uh, look, I don't mind telling you, I find it difficult to understand. Um, uh, I, I think. Uh, um, I think the demographic uh, um, it includes people, certainly, who felt that um, America was failing them in some mm. way. Uh, the idea of making America great again mm. uh, tapped into a fear that they had fallen from uh, some state of grace mm. uh, and that um, and, and their hopes became focused uh, in a man who already had quite a high profile for other reasons mm. and, in a sense, is the quintessential... Um, success story. Mm. Uh, he, he, he's a wealthy, powerful man. Yeah. And uh, the sort of American uh, milieu, uh, to some extent... His father was a millionaire. It's not mm. a bad leg up. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's Indeed. not a rags to riches story. No, but, but he represents that kind of... I, I guess, it, I, I'm speaking in very generalised terms, but that kind of American aspiration. Of, well, it's a Barnum and Bailey success. story, isn't it? He's the, the tub-thumping entertainer, town-to-town, -town, rallying it, the people. He taps in to the American psyche, to a particular yeah, group of people, and it's quite a large demographic. I mean, he got about 80 million votes in the mm -hmm. 2020 election, more than he got in 2016, to those that feel the world has passed them by. Mm. And, and, um, and, and has it to a degree? I mean, people are sitting there and seeing their, their factories closed down. Down, um, if they've seen their children go off to fight endless wars in mm. Iraq and Afghanistan, it, wouldn't they have a reason to look at no. Washington and feel betrayed? Oh, I think, I, I think that they did. I mean, America, in, in this century alone, America has spent $10 trillion, not billion, $10 trillion on wars that went nowhere, uh, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan or other interventions. And, of course, it was the ordinary... Uh, sons and daughters uh, of American people mm. who are going to fight these wars. And at the same time, they look around their own environment and they see steel mills going out of work, they see poverty, they see lack of opportunity, then they see something else they don't like, which is different, which is that they see America is less of a white society, less yeah. of an Anglo-Saxon society, society, less of a WASP, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant society, and they don't like that. Mm. They don't like that change either. Mm. So all that came together, I think, to... It helped to produce Brexit mm. and it helped to produce Mr Trump. Mm. Having seen what garners that kind of support, what you then do, of course, is an entirely different matter. There mm. are plenty of policies you can have that don't involve tapping into hate uh, or mm. racism. Yes, exactly. And, you know, Mr Trump is now dining with QAnon. I don't know if any of you have heard mm. that, but, I mean, you know, if you, th if you think uh, some people in this country are wacko, you haven't met QAnon, let me tell you. <laughs> they are wacko squared. And he, he's been dining with sort of pro-Nazis as well. In fact, I even saw recently, which doesn't happen very often, he was dining with his wife, so maybe there's some hope uh, <laughs> uh, in, in that. So this doesn't go away. This kind of populist sense that of a grievance and we're being left behind and this is the strong man. I mean, the best way to think of him is a Latin American general. Oh, he's a caudal. Mm. A caudal. He's a strong man in that. I don't think he'll get a second chance. But then, as I told him when I saw him, I said to him, don't run for president. This was way back in 20, uh, late 2015. I said, don't run for president. You haven't got a chance. So, obviously, my political advice is... <laughs> well, speak, listen to me speaking again. Of, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of media punditry, let's go to Lucy Bella. Um, 
in society, left-wing people think that the right rules society and vice versa. People seem to be stuck in echo chambers. Mm. How can we help people get out of these political echo chambers so that we can live in harmony and stop the demonisation of others? Mm. Fatima. Mm. Thank you for the question, Lucy. Uh, I... Yes, everyone can... <laughs> That's a fantastic question and the rise of right-wing extremism is very concerning and the incident that happened in Queensland obviously shook the nation uh, but also it, it was an attack on the very foundation of what makes us a society and it was an attack on the institution and people that protect us. Um, and so it, it's concerning and as a young person, you know, the misinformation and disinformation out there uh, really makes you quite wary of the information consumption. So, um, you know, my advice to young people in particular, because we tend to be more vulnerable in those online um, platforms where, uh, you know, the world's your oyster in a sense and everything's just a, a click of a button away, mm. but at the same time, uh, a sense of radicalisation and th all that misinformation can lead to those um, horrible things, um, which, which obviously we're... Um, trying to, mm. you know, uh, avoid. D D Dimitri, um, as someone in politics and looking, I assume, to have a political career, is it so much more difficult now, given the polarisation that we're seeing, the role of social media in that and the tribalism that we're seeing in our societies? Yeah, certainly. I think it makes it harder, particularly when we don't have as many shared spaces for us to all have a public debate together. Social media algorithms are driven by clicks, which are driven by producing more and more content that is similar uh, that people want to see. So really, people will only go onto uh, social media feeds and see what they already kind of believe and what they want to see because it works for those algorithms and it works for those algorithms and it works for those companies. I think that's something that we as a society need to be really conscious of and actively go out there and try to seek out information that challenges our own biases and gets out of those echo chambers. That's something that we need to be teaching our kids yeah, at school when it comes to how we actually engage with social media and just being really cognizant of that. Um, because, as Fatima said, um, extremism breeds uh, itself online and in these niche rabbit holes and echo chambers um, and we need to find a way to break through that. Um, so that's something that we really need to do. Where's the media failing, Andrew? You've been critical of the New York Times, particularly with its reporting of Brexit, but also there's been criticism of the Murdoch press and the role of Fox News in the rise of Trump, and you worked for Murdoch for a very long time. Where are we failing in the media? Are we contributing to this polarisation and misinformation? Oh, yes, no question about it. Mm. Um, the media today is the main echo chamber. Mm. And we all go to the echo chambers where we hear the messages that we like most in, in our ears. Mm. And the days when the media tries to provide a broad spectrum of opinion and have a debate about it, so that everyone... I mean, where, where, where is the strong voice tonight in favour uh, of voting against the voice? Mm. Uh, I haven't seen it. Mm. Uh, you know, whereas a good debate would have had at least one voice saying that. It's quite clear there's a lot of vo voices here in favour of the voice too. But let's have a debate. And I think the, the media does... I mean, you see it above all in America. Like, all these things, they start in America. Mm. And I watch... And I spend a lot of time in the States. So I watch Fox News, Mr Murdoch's channel, in the morning. There are six people there telling me how useless Joe Biden is. And then I switch over to another channel called MSNBC, <laughs> mm. which is a left wing, and there are six people telling me that Joe Biden's the fantastic. best president since FDR. <laughs> and it didn't seem to strike anybody who makes television programs that are in the morning, why don't we take three from one show, three from the other show, and put them all in the same studio, and then let's have a debate <laughs> about it. So we are part of the problem. We are not the solution. No. We are part of the problem. Mm. We're going to hear now from Abra Ahmed. Uh, in recent years, we saw an Australian commit the Christchurch, Christchurch mosque shooting, the shooting death of the two members of the police force in rural Queensland, which was motivated by extremism. And more recently, neo-Nazis were seen at a Melbourne protest. Is the government and the wider society taking the threat of far-right white extremism seriously? Are we spending millions of dollars like we did responding to the threats of Islamic extremism? Anne, can I go to you on that and then we'll go to, the, to, uh, to Fatima and, and Andrew? Look, I don't think we're uh, consciously dealing with the extremism in a, in a manner that is positive. 
uh, or affirmative. I mean, we need to be challenging these right-wing extremists. We need to be holding them accountable. We need to be exposing them. I mean, if, if there is one thing Aboriginal people know is these people because we have been held and, and terrorised by these people for generation after generation. So it's not a new phenomena at all. It's something that we've dealt with, but now it's gone broader and now all of a sudden it's become an issue because it's broader than just an Indigenous issue. So it's something that we definitely need to challenge. We need to uh, encourage our governments to be far more affirmative than what they are currently. Fatima, the, the question went to what, something you raised before, and that is the rise of right-wing extremism. But we also know that Islamist extremism is real as well and yeah. an ongoing threat around the world. How do we have an overall approach to, to extremism? Thank you for your question, Abrar. Um, and can I just say from the outset that uh, terrorism or extremism has no religion? Um, and I just want to make that clear because we don't want to put one uh, specific faith or group of people in a category. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think sometimes the media can blur the lines mm -hmm. there. Um, but in terms of what the government's doing, if I was to say, you know, to answer your question in particular, um, the Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill, is working diligently with our agencies through ASIO to make sure that they're preventative measures, but also we're working on strengthening Task Force um, Australia initiative, which basically will identify ways of us... Um, you know, strengthening uh, that democ democratic ways of, like, developing our resilience, but also ensuring that citizens are, are able to trust one another and there's trust built between governments and citizens because fighting extremism isn't something that the Commonwealth can do on its own. It requires a whole nation approach and each and every one of us plays a role in ensuring that we fight terrorism and um, extremism, whether it's on a low scale where we're dealing with, you know, on a personal basis or within a lo locality or whether it's on a national um, space. And, you know, the Albanese government is committed to ensuring that we're, we are a secure, safe and prosperous nation. Andrew, you, you famously um, called out... Uh in Paris after attacks there. Um, the Bataclan. Yeah, mm. Islamist extremists saying yeah. you won't win. What would you say to right-wing extremists who are also, we're seeing, growing across particularly Europe? Mm. What would you say to them in terms of how they won't win? We're coming for you. <laughs> I mean, democracies need to recover their confidence mm. and their faith in themselves. You know, as Churchill said, it's the worst form of government imaginable except for all the others. Mm. <laughs> and we need to be more militant in the defence of our democracy. And, mm. and don't play politics with, with, with this either, to say, oh, oh well, it's not just uh, Islamist extremism, we've got this right wing, or the right wing saying, oh, no, all the terrorism is Islamist. I don't care where it comes from. If you're prepared to... You know, and I was a Northern Ireland correspondent. Mm. I lived through a terrorist campaign that killed over 3,000 people. Wow. Uh, thankfully, came to, I was on an IRA death list for three years mm. uh, at one stage because we'd published some inconvenient stories. Mm. Actually, we'd published the guy that was raising all their money, so he wasn't that happy uh, uh, about it. So we have to remember... And this is a bad time for democracy at the moment, I think, because there is a kind of new respect for authoritarianism. Mm. Uh, I mean, Mr Trump wanted to be an authoritarian. Mm. There's a kind of... You know, it amazes me, not just on the left now, but there's a group of people on the right who think that Mr Putin is not such a bad guy mm. uh, and that Ukraine is really just full of corrupt people and doesn't deserve to be supported. The... Uh, don't want to bring it back to religion again, but the Pope seems to be, to me, rather too cosy with the Chinese at the moment. <laughs> so he can get the Catholic Church in there a bit more. Uh, this is a country which is basically ca carrying out the destruction of the Uyghur population uh, there, which, by the way, I don't hear the Arab world saying too much about either. So I think we need to realise that the world is dangerous at the moment. Authoritarians yeah. are on the match. The history of the 21st century, which was meant to be the triumph of... the ultimate triumph of democracy after the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm. and more and more countries were going democratic, including in Latin America, mm. and so on. The history of the 21st century so far has been the rise and success of authoritarianism. That's the danger. Mm. The biggest political party in France today after the government is Marine Le Pen.
on the, the National Front side. The second biggest party after her is a hard-left Marxist party. So we need to remember why we're democracies, flaws and all, that it's still the best way. It gives us programs like this where we can say what we want. I mean, we, you don't realize how important that freedom is until you lose it. And we need mm. to be militant. I use the word carefully, militant in the defense of democracy against extremists of everywhere, left, right, domestic, foreign. We take them out. Next, we'll hear from Kareem Olsakar. Uh, my question is directed at Ms. Fatima Payman. Uh, so, how do you represent a diverse constituency while staying true to your own religious beliefs? Thank you for your question, Kareem. Uh, that's a wonderful question. I get that asked a lot. Um, so, my morals and values are uh, what comes from my faith, and it's quite personal to me. Um, I understand that representing an entire state, my beautiful home state of WA, um, I represent people from all walks of life, people from different backgrounds, cultures, races, um, faiths, sexualities, abilities. And for me, the, the main thing that, you know, I keep in the front of my mind is making sure that their needs um, are always prioritised. So when I'm, you know, involved in constructive policy making decisions, I keep that in mind and um, go for what's best for my entire constituency as a whole. Um, I don't see my faith as in hind a, a hindrance or keeping me back from taking part in, um, you know, the, the decision making, but also uh, writing up pieces of legislation and representing um, my community. Uh, are there times when that is a conflict for mm. you, though? It hasn't happened, and like I said, my moral compass is based on my faith. What, um, what, sorry, Faye, but what, what would come first in that if you, were, if you were presented with something that you fundamentally could not square with your faith, what would come first, your responsibilities as a politician or your faith? If, if the decision is within my permit as a, a politician or as a representative, then that comes first because I am aware that I represent a diverse range of people um, who don't necessarily believe in what I do and I have made a commitment to myself that I won't impose my values and my faith and ideals onto my constituency, but at the same time, I won't shy away from sharing what my values are as a Muslim devout to her faith. Um, like I said, it's private, it's what keeps me grounded, it's what drives me and gives me motivation. Um, but again, as a senator, my, my role... Like, I, and I understand that I won't please everyone out there with the decisions that I make, but that's what comes with my role as a senator. Corinne, can I go back to you? How, how does that answer... Uh, do, does that answer some of the, your own questions about this? Do you find, as a young Muslim, you're attending an Islamic school, that it is difficult sometimes to be able to square your faith and the society that you're in? Yeah, I do find that. Mm. And, and how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Who uh, do you turn to at those times? I turn to uh, my, my religion, so what I believe in, and my, my, my parents, I guess, and my family, and, mm. yeah. Does that answer help you, that you can, you can separate those things and have different roles, different identities within a society? Yeah. It does. Mm. Kanishka, um, where is the line here between the protection of faith in the mm. political sphere mm. or should it be protected at all? Is it something private or is it something political? Uh, well, um, uh, certainly the Christian faith cannot be merely private. Uh, it has to be given expression uh, and, um, and it is, as uh, Christian people... Um, and I think this is true of people of many faiths, that they put into practice in their daily life, in their relationships, in the way they interact with uh, other people, with their aspirations for their community, uh, they, they put into practice uh, the, uh, the elements of their faith. That's, that's I think a different this, question, though, because in a secular society, it's one thing to practice that and have a public role, yeah. but should that be protected above the rights of others who may mm. find the views of some people of faith offensive? Well, I... I I think we use the expression a secular society too easily. I think mm. we're a multi-faith society, including people of no faith. Mm. Uh, and so the obligation on us is to, uh, is to coexist in a respectful and harmonious way. Mm. Um, and certainly there will be many faiths. I, 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 I'm willing to say all faiths will say that is how we ought to interact 
uh, in, a, in a plural community. I actually think that the, uh, in terms of um, the space that is occupied uh, by families, uh, by faith groups, uh, by communities, by unions, uh, by voluntary associations, uh, this kind of classic third space between the state and the market mm. is essential to preserving the kind of robust democracy that Andrew has been advocating. Because in the absence of shared values, even if they are within particular faith communities or um, associations around professions or whatever it is, uh, without that kind of shared space, every opinion uh, uh, simply um, uh, grabs to itself uh, a monopoly on virtue. Every, every other opinion uh, becomes not just a wrong opinion, but an evil opinion, an opinion that can be dispensed with and a person who can be dispensed with. And it is the interaction uh, of these uh, non-state, non-market, not, not about control, not about consumption, uh, but actually about compassion and community mm. uh, and, um, uh, and coexistence. It's that space that's occupied by faith, which is why it has to be protected. It does lead us to uh, the result of our online poll. Remember, we asked you, with the majority of Australians no longer identifying as Christians, should politicians still say the Lord's Prayer at the start of each sitting day? <laughs> no, resoundingly 85%, 12% uh, yes and 3% unsure. How do you feel about that, Fatima? As well, someone who, from a different faith, but in a parliament where one faith is privileged over another with, mm. with a prayer? Well, I must acknowledge from the offset that, you know, uh, the constitution of this country was, um, you know, very much under the Christian ethos. Um, when, I, when I enter the Senate uh, every morning, I uh, reflect, I use that period to just reflect and renew my intentions, to set my agenda for the day, to thank my Lord for the blessings and also just remind myself, why am I here What's the, the purpose I'm serving and who am I serving in terms mm. of my constituency? So I use that as a moment of reflection for me, but I guess it's for um, the Christian community out there to decide whether mm. that's no longer required. It does lead us to our final discussion tonight. Uh, question for the discussion tonight. Here's Oliver James Damien. According to the 2021 Australian Census, those declaring they have no religion, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, increased to almost 40%, second only to Christians. David Foster Wallace said, there's no such thing as not worshipping. We all worship. The only choice we have is what to worship. So do you think that these nuns really ditch religion? Or are they just, did they shift to worshipping things that are much worse? And what does that mean for the soul of our nation? Andrew. Gosh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. What, what, what was the point of the question? Well, well the, the, the question is, if people are turning away from faiths, right. are they worshipping other things instead? And may oh, those yes. outcomes be worse? They're worshipping reality television. Yeah. Uh, they're worshipping themselves. Yeah. Uh, they've elevated various things that they believe Capitalism. in. There are new religions around. Uh, these days, you, Mr. Trump supporters in some way are a religion. There's also a cancel culture these mm. days, which is something of a religion too. Indeed, it's almost as intolerant as religion historically been because I was brought up in the uh, uh, values of the Enlightenment, which were that people can really say what they want. I'll disagree with you, but I will protect your right to say whatever you, you want, and I hope you'll do the same for me. Today, if I disagree with you, I also want to destroy you. Mm. Uh, I want to wipe you out. Mm. And that, that, that is the end of Enlightenment values yes. uh, in, in, in that. And I think we've got to get away from that. And if you look, uh, as someone also of faith and a First Nations person, are there things beyond that that you look through to as well for guidance mm. for, to get you through a day? Look, uh, as an Aboriginal person, my faith is grounded in my understanding of the Creator from our ancestral stories. You know, where my identity comes from, land and country and relationships. And those things and family and community shape who I am today. So there are many things that influence my uh, view and, and how I carry myself. Um, 
other than just Christianity. Mm. My faith is based on my cultural identity. And that is the most significant thing for me. I can't do theology without that grounding. D Dimitri, as a, as a young person as well, um, just reflecting on that, you, you did raise this earlier where you were concerned that people were turning away from faith and that may be dangerous. What do you see people turning to instead of faith? And why is that dangerous? I think a lot of people are turning to themselves and they're focused on their own wants and desires. Um, mm. And that's not all bad, but I think it's not going to lead to a lasting sense of fulfilment for people. I mean, people worship themselves and their own identity, um, but I think that ultimately is short-sighted. Um, you know, no man is an island, um, is, a, is a famous saying. So I think people need to be conscious about forming connections in meaningful ways. That means getting involved in community groups, joining a religious organisation and finding purpose and meaning that is bigger than oneself because contributing towards that cause um, is its own sense of fulfilment and freedom. Thank you. And that's all we have time for. Thanks again to our panel, Andrew Neal and Patel Gray, Kanishka Rafael, Fatima Payman and Dimitri Chugpam. <laughs> Thank you as well for sharing your stories and your questions. Next week, I'll be live with you from Mildura. Joining me, singer-songwriter John Williamson, politicians Emma McBride, Michael McCormack and Bob Catter, and CEO of Mallee District Aboriginal Services, Darlene Thomas. Head to our website to register to be in the audience. Until then, have a good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm.